Open your Bibles today, if you are able, to Second Timothy chapter 3. We will go through the third chapter today, beginning in verse 1. Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful and unholy. Go back to verse 1. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. Good times are coming for God's people. But before it gets real good, it will get real bad. Not just in the world, but in the church. The description of people that God gives in the next few verses has always been, for the most part, true of people in the world. The thing about the last days is it will be true for people in the church as well. And the church is supposed to be a positive influence and consequently a blessing to the world, but when the church, at least too many in the church, cease to be holy, it means terrible times for the entire world. And verse 2, people will be lovers of themselves. And if we're not there, I don't know what there is going to look like when it finally gets here. We have to be awful close. People will be lovers of themselves. Not, not so much in the world again. This is talking about the church. And what is being promoted today? Look around. Most sermons, on television anyway, are, are just positive affirmation pep talks, all about self. No talk about repentance, not much talk about sin, not much talk about the cross of Christ, the blood of Christ, because that doesn't make people feel good about themselves, and that's not good for ratings, and that's not good for offerings, and that's because people are lovers of self more and more. And it's not just there. You, you go into a Christian bookstore and there are all kinds of books promoting self-love, self-fulfillment, self-actualization, self-assertiveness training. What in the world is this? And I know because I've taken a stand against this stuff in evangelical churches in the past and, and I've been blasted because of it or looked at cockeyed because of it. Like, who are you? Some kind of a throwback? But whatever, I want to know whatever happened to Jesus' words. Unless you deny self and pick up your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. And so, God must be first, others second, and we are to be third. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. And I suppose when people love themselves, they have to love money so that they can give self whatever it wants. And so many times we have seen this. Have money. Go ahead. Earn money. And have money. And enjoy what it buys. And money. To further the kingdom of God. That's all wonderful. Just don't love money. So how do I know if I love money? Well, if a person spends more time thinking about money than they do God. Or if they break God's commandments in order to profit financially, then they're loving money. And in that case... Money has become their God. And that's a problem. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful and proud, and those two go together. Pride is the sinful attitude. Boasting is the outworking of it. Boastful and pride. Times will be terrible because more and more people will think that the world revolves around them, or at least it should, because they are so great and they're so important the most important thing around boastful and prideful like the athlete who makes millions of dollars has a long term contract several years and makes multiplied millions of dollars but then walks out on his team in the middle of his contract just walks right out on his team to hold out for more millions and then he says it's not about money 
It's about respect. I deserve respect. Boastful, prideful, I deserve respect. So I'm going to break my contract and hold my team hostage because I deserve respect. There is something twisted about that thinking. And anyone who would respect an arrogant, self-centered person like that is just as warped as he is. Verse 2 says people will be abusive. There's always been abuse. But as the return of Christ draws nearer, there will be more and more abusiveness. And are you beginning to understand why God says times will be terrible? People will be abusive. People will be rude to others, saying hurtful things. They will hurt others physically as well when they can get away with it. Abusive. It's no accident that mass murder in schools and in the workplace is getting to be a common thing today when it was unheard of 25, 30 years ago. It's insane. People are abusive. It's the mark of a society that has turned their bad and has made self God. What I want is important. That's what they've been taught in schools for years. What I want is important. What I think is right is right. And how dare you lay me off? I don't think that's right. I'm going to come in and I'm going to blow you all away. How dare you, fellow students, say bad things about me? That's not right. I'm too important. I'm going to come in. I'm going to murder as many people as I can. I'll show you all. People are abusive. It's going to get worse as the return of Christ draws near. And then verse 2, God says people will be disobedient to their parents. Talking about children living at home. If you're a grown child living out of the home, you don't have to obey your parents. You obey God. But any child who lives at home and does not obey their parents... You know, they have an even bigger problem than not obeying their parents. Because every time they rebel against their parents, they rebel against God. And if children are not taught to respect authority at home, well, they're not going to respect authority um, in the job, in school. They're not going to respect authority, other forms of authority, outside the home either. They're not going to respect government. They're not going to respect police. And without proper respect for those in authority in society, there's going to be anarchy. That means confusion. And that also contributes to the terrible times. Verse 2 also says that people will be ungrateful. And that shouldn't surprise anyone. Self-centered, me-first people who have no respect for authority certainly are not going to be grateful. Grateful? Are you kidding? For what? I deserve everything I get. In fact, I deserve more than I have. I'm being shortchanged. I'm so I'm so worthy. Ungratefulness. You know, I see this more and more too. In stores, in gas stations. I will not go back to a gas station or a store where the checkout person makes you feel like you're doing them a favor by spending your money. No thank yous, no nothing. And as time goes by, fewer people will be grateful. And it just contributes to the misery. Verse 2 says that people will be unholy. Well, unholy people may believe in a God, but they don't live as if they believe in a God. They may not be Atheists, but they are practical atheists. They are the only God that they care about, which is also why they are ungrateful, which is also why they are unholy. They just do their own thing. And then verse 3 says, people will be heartless. Heartless or inhumane. They don't love the way they should. They're without natural affection. They don't even show towards those who it should be natural for them to love. They actually do not have the moral character of a wild animal because at least a wild animal cares for their own. And then God says people in verse 3 will be unforgiving or implacable. In other words, 
They're going to be so important to themselves, so self-centered, so important to themselves, so valuable to themselves, that they won't forgive someone who hurts them. They just absolutely will not be reconciled to that person. And it is a wicked person indeed who refuses to forgive someone who has repented and who has asked to be forgiven. There's no excuse for not forgiving someone like that. You don't have to be best friends, but you have to forgive. If somebody confesses and repents, you have to forgive. Even God forgives those who repent and confess. And so I guess people like this think that offending them is a greater offense than offending God. Verse 3 says that they will be haters of good. You think about that statement for a minute. Haters of good, that is depravity. They don't just sin, they love sin. And they hate good because they love evil. Now it's one thing to sin. We all sin. But it's downright demonic to hate what is good simply because it is good. That's demonic. And there are those today who hate people for no other reason other than they are good. Four. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to... Oops, I'm in the wrong chapter. I jumped way ahead. God says in verse 4 that people will be treacherous. Treacherous. In other words, people are going to be disloyal and unfaithful to those who trusted them. People will be traitors. They'll sell out anyone for a price. It's going to be dangerous to trust anyone in that day. Verse 4. Treacherous, rash. People will be rash, hot headed, inconsiderate. They're going to jump at the first thing that looks good, and when the thrill is gone, they'll jump to something else, and they don't care who they leave behind or what kind of harm they do to anybody in the process. Verse 4 says that people will be conceited. People will have a very high opinion of themselves, it's higher than what they deserve. And that's been drilled into people's heads over the last generation or two. This preoccupation with self-worth and self-esteem and all this other kind of stuff. To the point where I heard a few years ago that the United States had the lowest test scores in math and science in the industrialized nations of the world. They had the lowest test scores, but they had the highest self-esteem. Well, what does that tell you? tell you this garbage has been drilled into people's head. You get self-esteem from trying hard and working hard. People will be conceited. No one can tell them that they do anything wrong. Wrong? I don't do anything wrong. Wrong is anything that I don't like. Wrong is anything that I don't like that people do to me. And right is anything I do like, no matter who else doesn't like it. But I don't do anything wrong. Are you kidding And then verse 4 says, People will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. God gives us good things to enjoy. Evil people set their affections on those things instead of on the good God who in His kindness gives those things. And what a mess the world will be. When people act the way they are described in these few verses, The foundations of society are destroyed. You can't exist when people are like this. It's just not normal. It's wrong. And if people don't think it's wrong, watch society crumble. The problem is they're too blind to the truth to even recognize that society is crumbling because of immorality and because of sin. But no family can survive when people like are like this. No team can prosper if everybody on the team is like this. Nothing can survive when people are like this. And they won't. The Bible says that if God doesn't cut those days short, no flesh would survive on earth. Why? Because this is wrong. Society can't exist with people like this. It collapses upon its own moral rot. Five. having a form of godliness, 
but denying its power have nothing to do with them. This is talking about those who claim to be Christian. They go through the motions of worship. They are maybe involved in a lot of church activity, but there's no power there. No power. Oh, they, they may catch an emotional buzz at their service, get all pumped up from some pep talk, but their religion doesn't change how they live. It's a form of godliness with no power. That is, it's religion without holiness. Six, they are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over weak-willed women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires. And they are loaded down with sins and they are weak-willed. And the reason they are the reason they are loaded down is that they are weak-willed. And that's why they are also deceived so easily. And women were especially vulnerable back in those days. But the fact is, anyone, man or woman, who is <coughs> loaded down with sins, living in sin, not confessing, not repenting, is an easy target for false teachings and false teachers. Sin cuts us off from God. And when God isn't there to guide... People do what seems right in their own eyes and most of the time what seems right is what feels good to our sin nature. And you follow that road and you're headed for big trouble. And so it says in 6 and 7 They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over weak-willed women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires always learning but never able to acknowledge the truth. That describes many people today. Always learning, but never really learning truth. Because they're always just looking for something new. Something that'll tickle their ears. Something that'll give them a little shot of adrenaline. Some, something with sparkle. Maybe it's the latest evangelical fad. It seems to change from time to time. People go after it. Or maybe it's the latest quick fix books. That's all the rage. Read this book, Ten Minutes with God, and you'll have a perfect marriage. Ten minutes reading this book, and you'll have a perfect marriage. Some stuff like that. Or maybe it's the latest prophecy book. Always looking for something new something to give you the latest buzz the latest prophecy book perhaps and if that's the case as I have said in the past anything with the words oil mid-east antichrist or 666 on the cover you got a genuine bestseller because people lap up because they're looking for sensationalism always learning but nothing worthwhile it's just a bunch of trash that's all it is And if they would read Scripture, just read the Gospels instead of chasing foolishness, it solved many of their own spiritual problems. They'd be much better off. But notice verse eight: Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these men opposed the truth. Men of depraved minds, who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected. Janus and Jambres. Remember those two guys? They were. Pharaoh's spiritual advisors, I guess you would say. Priests. False prophets. They were the jokers who threw down their staff and turned into snakes when Moses did it in front of Pharaoh. And so they used sorcery to turn us. They did their magician's tricks to turn people away from God and His Word. And those who distract people today from the clear teaching of God's Word by their sensationalism, by their so-called new revelations, by their fads, by their latest you know, prophecy books or whatever it might be. Those who distract people from the clear teaching of God's Word by their sensationalism do the same thing as Janice and Jambres did. There's no difference. Basically, what is peddled is the National Enquirer with a Christian spin. That's all it is. 9. But they will not get very far. 
because as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. The influence of Janus and Jambres was pretty strong for a while, but eventually it fizzled. And every generation has its false teachers that gain influence, try to introduce so-called new teaching, new truth, new revelations into the church, but their success doesn't last. Not forever. The truth always wins out in the end because God loves truth and this world is His and He always wins. And so Orthodox Christian truth keeps marching on through the centuries. 10. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, endurance. False teachers may appear to be dedicated to Christ, but careful observation will show that they are dedicated to self. You watch their lifestyle. You take a look at how they live, and you see that they're not dedicated to Christ. They're dedicated to self. And Paul invites anyone to scrutinize him. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance. The way the apostle lived and the things that he said and the things that he taught proved that he was dedicated to Christ and not trying to get a following for himself. That's so obvious when you looked at him and his lifestyle and what he said. He was holy. He wasn't worldly. He promoted Jesus, not himself. He suffered. He sacrificed for Jesus. His holiness and his teaching often got him in trouble. But he was patient in suffering. He wasn't promoting self. He wasn't in it for himself. He was in it for Jesus. It was crystal clear. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. God rescued him from all these terrible things. Nothing outside of us can stop us, stop God's plan for us. And all sorts of terrible things happened to the apostle, but none of them stopped God from using him. God simply used the bad things that Paul did not plan on going through. And if God saw something that he couldn't use, he delivered the apostle from it. It didn't happen. And so the thing to remember is that even when things do not go the way we expect, God is using those things. Twelve. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Every Christian who behaves like Jesus will suffer like Jesus. Every Christian who speaks the word of God like Jesus will suffer like Jesus. You you behave like Jesus, you speak the word of God like Jesus, you're going to rub some people the wrong way. That's why it always leads to some form of sacrifice and some form of suffering. We can't get around it. The suffering may vary in intensity and in form, but if there is no sacrifice, and if there is no suffering, and if there is no opposition from anyone, then there isn't any holiness either. 12 and 15. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. As time goes on, there's going to be an increase in evil, and the distinction between the saved and the unsaved will become more definite as we draw closer to the Lord's return. You won't have any trouble picking out true believers. There will be no nominal Christians because of the persecution involved in naming the name of Christ. That weeds out false believers. 13 again. It says, While evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Sin deceives and then sin destroys. Man's sin nature always wants to go with sin. It wants to believe that sin is okay. Because that's what it wants to do. That's why. If a person doesn't allow the word of God to restrain their sin, well, sin is going to deceive them into believing that it's okay. 
that bad is good. But bad destroys souls. And bad destroys families. And bad destroys nations. Whether people believe bad is bad or not, it doesn't matter. Whether they're deceived into thinking bad is okay, it doesn't matter. Bad is still bad. And God warns us not to be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you have learned it. In other words, don't go chasing after new truth that contradicts old truth, which the church has believed from the beginning. Now, biblical doctrine can develop over time. But our, and, and our understanding can become more clear on certain doctrines. But when somebody comes along and says, you know, the church has had it completely wrong for the last 2,000 years, and they do a 180 on some doctrine, you can reject them. The church has taught that God is a trinity from the very beginning. That has been orthodox biblical truth from the beginning. So when Benny Hinn comes along and says, no, there are nine persons in the Godhead, turn that TV off or throw a brick through it. Look at verse 14 and 15 together. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible shows us how to avoid hell. It shows us how to be saved. It says it right here. It shows us how to be saved, and it says it's through faith in Jesus Christ. You won't see anything in Holy Scripture that says your good works outweigh your bad works and you won't go to hell. Scripture is clear. Salvation is a gift from God received by grace and only through Jesus Christ. But don't believe anyone who says the Scripture doesn't give us the information we need to be saved. It does. It says so right there. All Scripture is God-breathed. Stop there. God used the personality the style, the intellect, the vocabulary of men to write the Holy Scriptures. However, through the means of inspiration, God guaranteed that every word that they wrote was the precise word of God. And so it says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And that covers everything. What else is left? What else is there that the Holy Scriptures do not supply that needs to be supplied? This covers everything. The Bible teaches us what God is like. The Bible tells us how to please God. The Bible teaches us what doesn't please God. The Bible shows us what sin is. God uses the Bible to show us when we sin so that we can repent. The scripture makes a sinner feel guilty over their sin, but then the scripture also shows us how to remove that guilt through Jesus Christ. No wonder the devil hates God's word. No wonder he's running around trying to tell people it's not sufficient and you can't trust it. No wonder he tries so hard to get people to doubt the Word of God. He's not stupid. He knows how powerful it is. He just doesn't want anybody else to to know that. So that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, let someone tell you again that you need more than Holy Scripture to know how to be saved from hell, and to know how God wants you to live. The Bible, rightly divided, the Bible, rightly understood, tells us how to live for God. The Word of God has the power to make one a Christian and to make that Christian holy also. And next time, chapter 4. Until then, so long everyone.